So today I'm talking about peer learning, uh, the resources I use, and why I think it leads to a more active classroom. But I want to start off by discussing our feelings, our emotions. An instructor's mood impacts course quality. I feel like this is a statement, it's so obvious, it's almost not even worth saying, right? So of course I turned it into a graph. Uh, even though it's really obvious, when I said that, a lot of people nod their head. We don't discuss it that much uh, in conferences. We don't, I, especially myself in the past when I present, we can get into the weeds focusing on class averages, student participation, things like that. Uh, we don't ask each other ourselves, you know, does this make me excited to show up to classroom? Does this make me passionate? So that's going to be a lot of what I look at in today's classroom. So I'm just going to jump through this. I don't really know what I'm talking about today. <laughs> I did, I was uh, well prepared, but after hearing Dr. Uh, Borden's talk, it was an amazing talk, and it really changed my perspective on a lot of my resources. Uh, I'm kind of summarizing what I've used, and it was kind of, this works, I'm not really sure why, but when students, when they show up to class happier, when they have relationships with their peers, they seem to learn better. Uh, and I didn't really know why. I should have, it seems obvious, maybe in hindsight, looking at Dr. Borden's talk. Uh, so hopefully this plays in my favor. What I'm saying has more, it's more valid after Dr. Warren's talk, but it might lead to more disorganized slide. So quickly review peer learning. Peer learning, it's a really general term, just talks, uh, it's really discussing or encompassing any activity where students are learning from each other, teaching each other. Or it can be them debating each other. Uh, it can also be assessment as well. So I've really found it wasn't maybe the first intention, the first reason I adopted it, but it's really resulted in a more active classroom. It's been one of the biggest, uh, strongest consequences. I love this quote. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. I also thought it, it was Einstein that said it, but if you go online, there's actually a lot of debate about if I actually said it, but I like it better if Einstein <laughs> says it. So I really believe that uh, when a student teaches a concept to a peer, it's a really valuable learning experience. It's a win-win situation. The student doing the teaching, uh, they're having to use higher levels of cognition to take something they've learned and kind of condense it, explain it to a peer. The other person is benefiting as well, the person receiving that instruction. They're getting uh, the concept taught to them from a different perspective and from someone that hasn't really mastered it. A big flaw with lectures is we already know the material. We've kind of mastered the material. It's tough for us to explain it to someone that's seen it for the first time. So I think it's a real win-win situation. Uh, when I first started teaching six, seven years ago, uh, at the end of the semester, and I was teaching Eco 101, so first year university course, really introductory material, a friend of mine who's not a teacher said, hey Alex, did you actually have to relearn a lot of that material? I know it's like first year stuff. Uh, and I laughed at him. I said, after teaching this course, I am now aware of how little I actually knew. I think it's probably obvious to you guys, a room full of uh, most instructors, but until you can teach something, someone that's not familiar with that concept, you really don't know it. So I've really tried to keep that throughout my teaching career, real, realize that teaching something itself is a learning opportunity. And I also feel that it really helps students develop soft skills that they don't otherwise get. They definitely don't get just sitting down doing a multiple choice question questions or tests on their own. They learn to, uh, there's a lot of interpersonal skills there. They learn to listen to someone else, understand them, uh, explain something to them, debate, especially constructive criticism. There's a lot of opportunities to provide constructive criticism. These are really valuable tools, especially later on in their careers. I think students nowadays, you could get through, you could easily get through university without making any friends, with showing up to every lecture, check out Facebook on your phone before a lecture, listen to a lecture, study, pass the courses. You can get through university like that. When you get out into the real, in the real world, you're gonna really struggle though if you haven't developed those interpersonal skills. Is that five? Thank you. I'm really proud of this slide title, title, Technology Giveth and Technology Taketh Away. I was able to work in a chart into my presentation and a metaphor from the Old Testament. So that's a win in my books. So kind of start with the obvious. Uh, we all know smartphones, like the one that's failed me in this presentation, are a big distraction to uh, today's classroom. It's tough to lecture to a room when 
a lot of students are spending half their time on social media or watching something on Netflix or watching uh, hockey or something like that. So there's a lot of focus on that, but I don't think there's enough focus on how technology smartphones have prevented a barrier to students developing relationships with their peers. When I started teaching, again, it wasn't that long ago, six or seven years ago, I'd be at the front dealing with a technical error like I just had, so I'd be running late probably. And students were often making small talk, just talking about the weather uh, or the, the score in the hockey game last night, things like that. Nothing major. Uh, nowadays, I'm still not any better. I probably have more technical problems, if nothing else. But my students aren't doing that. They're just sitting on their phones. They're not, many of them aren't making small talk. So that maybe doesn't seem like much, but I think that's a really big deal. That's a big loss to our learning environment. And I literally have my notes something like, it's vague, it's intangible, but I think it really matters. I don't know why, but I think it really matters. And it's beautiful that Dr. Borden gave that talk, and a lot of it was on why it matters, how that social connectedness, uh, I think the word was glutamate, it reduces glutamate, glutamate, the anxiety around learning. But I think that's key, especially uh, in the active classroom. If a student shows up and they know some people in that class, they're gonna be more comfortable in that learning environment. It's going to improve their self-confidence, and I think they're going to be a lot more likely to put up their hand and ask a question. Or uh, when a few students are debating something, for them to join that. So I think there's a lot of vague intangibles that uh, aren't getting enough attention that are really complementary to an active class or just a quality learning environment in general. So I wanted to cover kind of a positive note, too, with this side. Uh, technology giveth, uh, taketh away, but mostly giveth. So although technology has presented us instructors with a lot of barriers to reaching our students, it's presented us with a lot of opportunities. Um, there's a lot of great examples already. Uh, the previous session by Fiona did a great job showing how we can use learning catalytics to really reach our students, even in a classroom of three or 400, which I, uh, that's my first year economics courses. So it's presented a lot of opportunities. Also uh, made it easier to kind of make the classroom more interactive. So quickly go over the three resources I do to foster peer learning in a classroom. So every week, uh, my students have to participate in an online discussion. They have to ask, usually it's set up so they have to ask one question, post two responses to peers' questions before they come to class. So it's material we haven't covered. I get my TAs to moderate these discussions to make sure they're appropriate and to make sure the quality level. Uh, they're not getting the participation mark just by mashing a keyboard, they're actually. Uh, putting effort, thought into it. So one thing that I wasn't really expecting is um, it, just the idea of generating curiosity. Well, there's a lot. It's them, like Dr. Gorin kind of talked about. Uh, man, I've already talked. He told me someone throw a dinner roll at me if I forgot this. But it was do, show, tell. Is that the first ones? Yeah. I really think it pulls into this. Before I stand up here and uh, kind of lecture on the content, they're getting their hands messy with the material. So that's really good. They have to spend quite a bit of time researching something to create a question. It's tougher than uh, students realize coming up with a question. It's easier to just me come up with a question and them provide a response. But it also generates a lot of curiosity, uh, which really helps them motivate. If they show up a bit curious about the subject, they're going to be a lot more likely to ask questions, participate, things like that. And I also encourage my students to use sources. So it's not often academic journals. My students are posting memes, videos, articles. So it's really cool they're relating the concept um, to something that's relevant to them. And it's also useful for me. When I do my lecture, I don't have to find a video or an article that makes sense or relates to them. I can just kind of steal it uh, from the discussion. Question? I've tried with a few different platforms. My school's LMS, uh, Moodle. I've tried it with PackPack as well, another software. So there's quite a few. I think almost every LMS uh, does it. Um, key is to have some moderation there with your TAs or software can do it, things like that. So next one I did, and this one should be fairly easy because uh, we started the previous presentation with the ThinkPair Share, share Activity, uh, Fiona's presentation, um, where she asked us, where does the mask go? We answered it, most of us got it wrong. She, she told us we got it wrong, and then we had to talk to our neighbors. So this is really how I used to think pair share activities in my class. And the cool thing is I never know when I'm gonna use a think pair share activity. I just go up to class, I have three or four 
uh, questions with my student response system, if that's learning catalytics or whatever system you use. Um, and I go, I run through it. If I get a distribution where most of them pick the wrong answer, or some of them pick the right answer, like here, 50% still got the right answer, but 39% didn't, I'll say, hmm, that's an interesting distribution, let's try this again. It's really easy to implement, especially if you're already using uh, a student response system, like learning catalytics. So the third one is two-stage exams, which is a really fancy, weird term, uh, but it's fairly simple. So you break an exam, most people do this for midterms, into two stages. So the first stage is students show up, uh, they write the midterm individually. And that's worth 80% of the mark. So they show up, write the midterm individually, and then a day or two later, they show up, write the same exam, but as a group. So this is worth 20% other mark. So there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, I've really done it hands off. I just say, show up to class, sit with whoever you want. Um, if you decide halfway through you don't like them, switch groups, I don't care. Your group can be one or two of you, it can be 10. You can switch groups. I just kind of leave it hands off. But it's been a really great uh, experience. The other thing a lot of people do, and I did, which works well, is adopt the do no harm policy. So in the very rare event they do worse on the group exam, relative to the individual exam, I take their individual grade. So this is really, it seems like uh, nothing. When you look at the data, less than 1% do worse, but it does a lot to reduce their anxiety. So it's a lot of fun. It's the exact opposite atmosphere to traditional exam. It's loud. Uh, it's crazy. There's people actually, the weirdest thing, there's people smiling and laughing, which I never thought would ever occur in a university exam. I was very surprised. So it's only worth 20% of the midterm marks. So that's 4% of the grade overall. So when I first said, I thought, this isn't worth enough. They won't show up or really try. I couldn't be more wrong. They took it so serious. Uh, they were so motivated, especially, I think, for my non-academic uh, students. So first time I did this, uh, at the back were a group of guys. They're on the football team. They barely show up to class. They definitely don't take it that serious. During the group exam, while I was walking around back, I was almost on the floor laughing. So they are not just taking it serious. The level of intensity these guys had, <laughs> buddy, buddy, it's B. You're not applying the diminishing marginal uh, returns to capital right. No, 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 you're missing the labor market allocation wrong. I was blown away at how serious they're taking it. And it wasn't because they care about my class or economics. They just want to be right. Uh, or they want to beat their friend, especially uh, athletes, I guess. Maybe that's why it really resonated with them. But it really works well. Uh, in general, these peer learning opportunities or resources well, work well because deep down, I think human beings were social animals. And we also like to argue, debate with each other for the most part. So it's a really uh, effective way at engaging students, especially your kind of lost souls, uh, for better words, the ones that have never really taken school that seriously. And it was really effective at an icebreaker. So before the first group exam, I do two midterms in my class, so two group exams. Uh, for that, when I say, you know, most of you had the right, wrong answer with the um, learning catalytics question, not a lot of them were talking to their neighbors, maybe half were. After, and before I did my first group exam, my inbox was jammed full of students saying, I'm really shy, I never know anyone in my class. And I was thinking, oh man, this is gonna, isn't gonna work, what's gonna happen? Uh, but that totally changed after that first group exam. Everyone, and even after that first group exam, I was surprised how many students were standing up, shaking their hands, like, hey, that was fun, like, uh, by the way, I'm so-and-so. -so. so it was a really effective icebreaker. After that first group exam, students uh, knew each other, all the peer learning activities worked a lot better. So I've really found, of all resources I've adopted, it's really uh, worked well, especially the group exams and the peer, uh, the think, sh think, pair, share activities. So it can seem, I think a lot of times, if a disgruntled instructor looked at this conferencing active classroom, they might think, that's ridiculous. We know most of our students just want, they're just in college or university to, I don't know, stepping stone for their career or because their parents want to be there. Uh, and that's true, a lot of students are motivated by that. But I think peer learning activities, they work really well because our students, they're so, they want to make friends in class. It's really difficult. There's a lot of barriers like smartphones, but they do really want to make friends in the class. And they're also like some level of competition. It kind of plays into the idea of gamification. Uh, we're seeing a lot more. But in general, I feel like it really changed the mood of the classroom. I've 
in my notes, it's, I'm just saying it's intangible vague. I don't know why this works, but Dr. Borden's talk really uh, made it more clear. It's reducing anxiety, reducing, uh, what were the words, cortisone, glutamates uh, in the exam, and that makes for a much more conducive learning environment. And it's just a lot more fun for me. When I show up to my class, when people are chatting and smiling and laughing, it's a lot easier to teach. So really, I found, you know, if my students didn't like this or uh, they're just neutral, I probably would still use it because it's been really rewarding and fun for me to implement. And it's really led, helped lead to a more active, engaged classroom. So in there, uh, do I have one or two minutes for questions? Yep. Yeah, so I did, I kind of want to uh, avoid that, to focus on the mood, but I did see a bump up in class averages, especially later midterms. And a lot of my students actually told me after the term that that's where their aha moments were, where the light bulb clicked. They were thinking about it, but in the group exam, they're, they're revisiting the concept or theory with less anxiety, and they're being taught by their peers. So I was, I was really surprised at how many of my students said, my, I never got this, and this is maybe an intermediate class um, until the group exam.